All right. We have with us Simon Prentice. Hiya. Thank you so much for joining us again. Um, okay. I I got through your book. Uh, was it? It was it was a journey I enjoyed. It wasn't like it. It wasn't uh, one of those books that you're like, what is he saying? Like it's very clear, and the points that you make at the latter half of the book are, are what I really want to explore today. Okay. And um, I was mentioning just earlier bef- when we were when we started this conversation, if it's all right, if I can paraphrase a statement and us yes. go from there or read read a, a, a sure. quote from it. Okay. So page page two forty. Uh, this doesn't give the book away, but it's kind of the thesis. Okay. So the seductive. I, the seductive I want people to understand what it's about. So, you know, you can give it a rope them in, rope them in. Yeah, okay. okay. Well, yeah. The, so the so, stuff that people, we all need to be thinking about and talking about. I think so. Exactly. I mean, this is well. I'll, I'll tell you what we'll I get, think. In a second. We'll so here it is: the seductive traps of culture, religion, and identity, and the sheer drag weight of tradition are still powerful barriers to acknowledging that we are all the same people trying to solve the same problems in the same limited space. Yeah. So we look at this now. I mean, what's going on in the world? Yeah. Uh, The culture, religion, and identity are what's holding us back from solving the problems that are facing us all across the board. Every single human. Yeah, well, that, that, that's that's what's holding us back at the level of sort of thinking about us and them, you know, and, and, and why why aren't they us? And well, they you know different culture, different language, even different religion. All the, all those 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 the sort of on the individual level the things that stop us. But then above that, there are issues which we maybe come to about why we can't rise above that, and well, what do we need to do to actually get through all that? But I think for me. Just if I made it to sort of talk about how I got to there, it was like mm-hmm. going into another culture and learning another language and really just sort of totally absorbing another way of looking at the world. And you start to think, oh, wait a sec. They know the same stuff that we do. <laughs> but you and until you can really go into that, it's really hard to understand it. You just you just don't see that. So it's because we grow up in a particular bubble and we we only see what's in that bubble and we don't imagine that. The other little bubble is actually equally as rich and equally as, as sort of, you know, profound, if you like, about uh, understanding. I mean, we're we're all the same thing. We're all feeling the same things. We're just doing it differently. And when we see something different, we go, "Ooh, that's different." But it isn't really. <laughs> it's the same. It's just looking at it a different way. That's all. Yeah. If that makes like, sense. And we're all just trying to live here. I mean, sure, we have different cultural norms or whatever if if you may but ibram x candy who wrote how to be an anti-racist he kind of was laying the groundwork for this things that we already know but for Mm. for me perhaps i didn't have the language but i you have it here you know if you travel to other cultures yeah and you're not a tourist you know like you you actually experience the culture yes yes you're welcome to you start to notice that that's right. That's right. That no, you know, I mean, you know, there's more alike than there is dissimilarities. And you, and you don't you don't need to to learn a language to find that out, and you don't even need to travel to find that out. I think you know you you can. It's, people do spot it by themselves, but it's 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 one of the easiest ways to to realize it. I think is is to travel and find yourself in a different culture. That's that's the most immediate way that you can you can sort of notice that there's a problem should we say and i think that there's there's two ways right there's there's the abstract that's when we can learn from a distance if you will mm. that okay you know as ibram x candy says there's no superior or inferior cultures there's just cultures right mm. or there's just groups if you will mm. so there's the abstract way you know you could read it in a book but then there's you actually experience it and I, I do think that, again, experiencing a different culture is really that, that enriching thing. I mean, like you talk about in your book, language is quite limiting, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it's, it's, it's like we're, we're, well, we're trying. It's yeah, limiting and liberating at the same time. Exactly. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to say. Yes. Yeah, so, that's the thing. so 
We don't use it to its full potential yet. Oh. Is that would you would you agree? Well, we're not no, I, no. I, I think it depends. It, it's a tool. Basically, it's a tool. Like any tool, if you are you know experienced, then you, you use it differently to somebody who, who who's just starting to learn to use it. But the thing about language is that it it we use it to learn about the way we do things you know i mean as a child that's what we're all learning that's why you go to school you know but it's not just going to school it's the way you you mix with your your friends in the neighborhood and all the things you grow up taking for granted that are just this is how language is how you get all that stuff and without yeah. language we, we would be you know have nothing we'd just be animals scratching around in the woods so you, you kind of need all that but to the extent that you believe that that is the way to do something then you're in a then then we get into trouble because everybody <laughs> thinks that their way is the way whereas in fact it's just a way and what we need to do is to try and rise above that and and see that the big picture so language is is a indispensable enabling mechanism i think i call it somewhere in the book i mean it's it, without language nothing but yes. you you can't get trapped in it if you're stuck in language you're in prison i think as simon Weil says in the, at the beginning of the book i quote her veil i should say yeah <laughs> and 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 that's a good point right is that we build upon our past through stories and mm. things like that mm -hmm. but we also have to realize that um i'm trying to think of the like there's a convergence there's divergence and there's convergence right uh -huh. especially yes. in terms of evolution yeah and what we're hoping for is a convergence. Yes. Not that we come into one, you know, singular thing. Like we still have obviously our separate cultures, hmm. but we have to work together. And it's almost like with what's going on in the world that we're being forced to work together at this point. I just earlier, I was telling you about the climactic changes yeah. that are happening in my backyard. Um, with with flooding i mean in the fraser valley i, I said it it's turned from being at this prairie this fertile farming agricultural region to now it's an archipelago because yeah. of the flooding i mean places homes yeah. are underwater right now well that's going to happen is, all over the world yeah yes i mean, I mean you know bangladesh and all that area where people live like about one meter above the sea in these huge delta areas, there's going to be millions of people who just suddenly have nowhere to live. And uh, this is going to be a problem <laughs> unless we have some way of discussing how we're going to handle that. And that that's really the big issue is sort of how do we deal with those problems? How do we, where is the forum where we discuss how to deal with it? Because if we were dealing with within one country, there is a forum to do things. You know, we, we generally have a legal system. We have, you know, places you can go to have your voice heard and be represented and make a case and then people can decide. Whereas on the international scale, we don't have that. And we should. I mean, we, we theoretically have it because that's what the UN is supposed to do, but the UN isn't doing its job. And why isn't it doing its job? Well, you know, maybe we can go into that later, but uh, it's a very simple reason. There's a veto. Yes. And that's, that's the problem. What did you say that was? Art Article five three eight or something like yeah, that. Article three seven seven. It's uh, it's um. Well, I, I found this out because I was, again, as I was saying to you earlier, one of the reasons I wrote the book was because of you know the Syria situation when that started way back when, and it just seemed to me that the international community was doing absolutely nothing. I mean, this is obviously the kind of thing that the UN was set up to stop. It was an international breach of the peace. It was spilling out into all the surrounding countries. There's this wild civil war going on. And nobody was doing anything to try and sort of say, hey, guys, let's just calm down here. Let's just see what the issues are. I mean, it was just every every night you're getting these barrel bombs being dropped out of the sky onto innocent children and the whole thing's just blowing up in your face. And you think, why aren't we discussing what to do about this and then you go into it and you realize well people were trying because they had conversations at the un and then you have this thing called the security council which is like the inner cabinet and there are five countries that have vetoes and they can just say no we don't want to do that 
And you think, hey, wait, what, what do you mean you don't want to do that? <laughs> What's this? Where we, what, what happened in a democracy? I don't, that's not how it works. Surely we discuss the merits of the case and we vote and we decide what to do. But uh -uh, that's not what we do right now. But resolution 377. So I was digging into it and I was thinking, has nobody thought about a way around this? And then I, then I found this thing, resolution 377, which is basically something that was decided back in the 50s where they went if the security council is blocked because one of the countries is going i don't want to play ball which is basically what happens it's either russia or usually america actually in the context of the middle east sometimes china you know they just go no that's it okay we don't want to hear about it anymore just forget it we're not going to talk about it anymore and so in that situation what do you do and resolution 377 is, is designed specifically to say, in that case, then we can throw it back to the General Assembly, which is all the members of the United Nations, and have a vote on it there. And we decide at that level what to do. People seem to have forgotten that that thing exists. <laughs> so at the risk of going on a little bit on my, laboring my point, but I, I heard this international lawyer on the radio talking about it going, oh, yeah, it's a terrible situation in Syria. If only there was something we could do about it. And I just read about this thing. And I thought, wait a minute, he's an international lawyer. Doesn't he know about this thing? So I looked him up and found his number and I called up and I left, left him. I oh, know, sent him an email, I think. And I got an email back saying, call me. So I called him and he said, uh, so what is this th resolution 377? And I said, well, hang on, you're the international lawyer. You don't, you don't know? And then I told him, he was, oh, oh yeah, that. Oh yeah, I remember now. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, you're right. That that does still exist. That's going. What? And then he said, "Do you mind if I? Um, I I'm doing an interview with the BBC tonight. Do you mind if I mention it?" I said, "Huh? Do I mind? Be my guest. Go ahead." So I watched the interview later on in the evening, and he didn't mention it. He didn't. So he didn't mention it. So I phoned him up the next day and I said, what the hell? I thought you said you were going to mention it. He said, yeah, well, I did, but they cut it out in the edit. No way. So then, <laughs> this is going to turn into a long shaggy dog story, but I saw a letter in the New York Times from two Harvard professors, I think they were, saying more or less the same thing, saying, what a tragedy, we can't do anything about this. But you know, with the way the UN is and everything. So... I tracked them down, found an email, sent them an email and said, um, guys, resolution 377, ring any bells? And they went, uh, oh, yeah, no, but, mm, well, yeah, no, Larry, no, you have to talk to Larry. He's the expert on that. And it's sort of like, so I phoned them up and they eventually, the bottom of the barrel is they all agree, yes, it does exist. Yes, it can be used, but, you know, it's tricky. You know, it might offend somebody, and you know, we don't want to get anybody upset, especially in the context of the Middle East. Da, 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 and you know, it's sort of so. Anyway, I was very surprised to know that a it existed, and b people know it exists, and c we're not using it. What the hell, you know? Well, and and I just I was pulling this up too that. This is very important. So I, I actually don't want to lose this point, but the security council, a lot of people might not know. Mm. I don't think I knew this until I read the book, but they're, they're like locked in place. Like they can't be voted. Like it's always the I, same. I, people. I, there are five permanent members. Yeah. And basically. And if, you, and if even one of them vetoes it, yeah. it's yeah. can't go through. That's it. It's not even a majority vote. It's just, just mm. one. All it takes is one. So how well, can anything very, ever be very clear, you've got all the countries in the world, it's like 195, yeah. whatever, 193, doesn't matter. You know, so that all the members of the UN can vote on something in the General Assembly. It's like, you know, if somebody has a problem, you can discuss it. And then if it's like a problem that something has to really happen, they have like a cabinet of 15 countries, and that's called the Security Council. And 10 of those members just rotate on a two-year basis. So they get vote in the next you know you you get a turn basically every now and yeah. then but five of the members were actually the countries that were the victors in the second world war right they're the permanent members and they have a veto and only they have a veto so you can have as you often do in, a, in a contentious issues it can be 14 votes saying yeah we agree that we should do this and then one country goes except we don't so forget it and you just end up with nothing happening. Yeah. It's ridiculous. 
Yeah. So. Well, it's a toothless tiger, like in every sense of the word. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Right? I don't know the expression, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, because it looks very scary, but the, or you yeah. know what I mean. There's there's this power there, but it's power that's never actualized. Right. So, so this resolution three seven seven. Yeah. This was saying, this was saying that. It's saying that in that case, so if we yeah. got to that situation, if you actually one person it, vetoed it. Yeah, yeah, one person vetoed it. So that means the the Security Council can't do, let's say in Syria. Its job in Syria is to say, calm down, guys, stop fighting, and we'll talk about it. And if you don't stop fighting, we'll send in some people to make you stop fighting, like a police force, basically. Yeah. That's what they should do. And peacekeepers. Yeah. But if one country vetoes it, then they can't do that. So we're we're not they're not able to do what they what they are supposed to. So in that case, resolution three seven seven says that the other countries can get together and say, look, you guys have just not done what you're supposed to do. So we'll take it from there. Thank you very much. <coughs> that's, that's basically what it's designed to do. So if the Security Council is not doing its job, you throw it back into the General Assembly and the General Assembly can decide what to do. Makes sense? <coughs> no, I, no I, I try not to be or sound like a conspiracy theorist here, but... Well, I think you have to fishy, right? again, again, I go into it in the book, so I, I don't want to sort of go into too much detail here. But I mean, it's, it's historically because the first time they had a go at it, right, was after the First World War, because the First World War just screwed up everything. Yeah. You know, I mean, Britain lost its empire. The countries of Europe were devastated and it was just a real mess. So they decided, OK, let's try and do something to make sure we don't do this again. So they had this thing called the League of Nations. Yeah, but which was invented by the United States. Uh, yeah, it was indeed. Woodrow Wilson, he was he yeah. was all part of that. So they, unfortunately, they decided it was even worse then because like every country has a veto. So <laughs> it's like, good luck with making that work, you know? Yeah. So after the Second World War, they went, well, that, obviously that didn't work. So let's, let's make it uh, a little bit better. Let's just have five people. And it was really just like, well, we won, so we get to say, right? Yeah. That was it, you know. And um, that doesn't work there, you know. I mean, it doesn't even work in our own terms. We're the ones who ground the world saying, everybody should be democratic, you know. We'll, we'll, send, we'll go and send an army in and blow you up till you're democratic. But hang on, you're not democratic. We're actually not democratic at the place where it counts. We, we just aren't. So, what, so what, what would you say that we are then? Or we're, we're um, a dictatorship, essentially. I mean, who, who has a veto? It's a dictatorship of the five great powers. They just get to decide what they want to do. It's a stitch up, you know. So the point is, how do you get them to stop doing that? It's like, how do you get turkeys to vote for Thanksgiving or, or whatever the expression in the States is? You know, I mean, it's like, they're not going to give it up easily. But the reason I wrote the book is because not e nobody's even talking about it. It's like mm -hmm. until you have a start to have a conversation and say, hey, this is wrong. You know, how does this make any sense? Until that conversation starts, nothing happens. And and therein lies, I think, the solution. I mean, so much with the Internet, so much information is read. Talk about tools. The Internet, it, it's a tool. Yeah. It has services oh, yeah. and disservices. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, to, to, you know harken back to McLuhan, but uh, we have all this information at our hands. And right mm. now you and I are having this conversation across mm. the pond yeah. seamlessly, right? It's a little Is late for good? you. I apologize, it's okay. but it's almost like talking about climatic change and it's, we have to speak up and democracy is Greek, I believe for of the people. Yeah. Rule by the people. Rule by the people. Most of people and crassy means rule or something like that. So, so could you... it be that in the 21st century? Sorry, and sorry to interject, but with internet and technology and the readily availability of information and our ability to uh, um, promote it or whatever, could this be the age 
potentially of actual democracy. Absolutely, I, I think I think it could. I mean, as they say at the end of the book, it's like all that needs to happen. You don't have to to do anything else except start talking about it. You know, because once we start talking about it, there's enough of this going on that that everybody can connect up about it and start to create some create a stink about it basically because really seriously we do need somebody to start talking about it i mean i really did research quite a lot in the book because i thought somebody must be talking about it but if they are that it's just such a tiny little minority that I mean, it, it's never up for debate in the in the in the great sort of public media discourse when have you when have you last in, heard anybody talk about the un you know it's just not even up for up for discussion yeah. So I, w I would like this to become a discussion, basically. It's like, excuse me, why are we not doing the job? It's like I mentioned that thing about Martin Luther King coming to, to Washington and saying he got a check in his hand, right? Mm -hmm. You know, he, he's, he didn't come just to say, please, guys, you know, come on, be nice to us. No, no, no. You guys have agreed to do this. The legal fucking document, excuse my French. Yeah. You know, it's like you wrote this in your constitution. This is a so problem. Why are you doing it, right? So I'm saying the same thing about the United Nations. You agreed to do this, guys. It's not just something that you thought, well, maybe we might, we'll give it some thought. No, no, it's a legal document. You signed it. So why aren't you doing it? That's what, that's what I'd like to know the answer to. So since, since you started on this, this, this journey and you've mm. reached out to these people, mm. what, where are you where? at in terms of the feedback that you're getting right now? Um, I ain't getting any feedback from the United Nations, that's for sure. Maybe, <laughs> I, should, maybe I should send a copy to the, the Secretary General and say, hey, would you answer this question for me? In fact, maybe I'll do that. I'll do that. Yeah, and, and, and you know, put a, a sticky note on that part. Yeah. You know, I'm sure he's reading. You'll see. I'm, I'm sure he's reading 376 <laughs> other resolutions. Right. Probably. <laughs> but um, I, I think it's a reasonable question. I don't, I don't think it's a question that... Uh, you know, you know, you, people will say, "Oh, yeah, you're you're just, you know, that's 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 hippie sh hippie shit." You know, it's like, well, and if it were, <laughs> it's still a question that you got to answer. Excuse me, why is the UN not doing its job? I mean, really, why is the UN not doing its job? Because it's agreed to do this thing and it ain't doing it. So, where's that? I mean, if that was any any like like a corporation or any kind of, yeah, you know. Right organization you came into contact with in your life in your it's country a legal case. yeah it's a legal case it's a class action you know right across the board you are not doing what you said you'd do i mean if the un you, you, the, the guys that run the un the secretary general he ought to be have them all up in turn in front of the un and say okay excuse me here's this contract which you signed um can you kindly explain why you're not doing it let's have it you know in turn Put the spotlight on them name and shame you know oh that's so naive you can't make that happen in the real world well if you answer my question then i'll back down but until you answer my question i'm not backing down you know <laughs> and and now that this is out there i mean that's that's just it it's it's again you know you we go back in time and we see how information has been disseminated yeah. The printing press. I mean, that was like, you know, right? Yeah. yeah. Gutenberg's press. Yeah. Now we're getting to like, you know, if if Marshall McLuhan and all of those thinkers at the time could see this right now, this is the oh, yeah. Gutenberg galaxy. Yeah, 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 totally. The world right? brain, as H. G. Wells called it, you know? Yeah, totally. This is it. We are here now. Yeah. It's really and exciting. I'm it, it is, but it's also like, it's, that's why um, I'm reading this other book right now called The Delusions of Crowds or The Delusion okay. of Crowds. Okay. Wonderful book. And, and uh, I mean, it's way too smart for me, but they're, they're talking about, have you ever heard of Solomon Ar Ash? Arsh? I'm not saying his, I'm not saying his name Let's right. Anyways, yeah. he talked about sociology and how ideas uh, this is what he said. Small groups, entire societies develop distinct cultural, moral, and religious values, mm -hmm. often explosively, like in the moment. So, for example, millennialists, right? Yeah. Uh, and and the, the, the idea of this disseminating idea that goes against, that can actually be 
destructive towards society is mm -hmm. similar to a contagious disease. Oh, yeah. And that's what I'm also seeing with the Internet is that there is it's it's I don't think it's ever going to be totally unified. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be dissenters. I mean, you think about the Protestant Reformation. How many different sects of Christianity are there now, right? <laughs> Probably, I have no idea. No, I, 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 I looked it up in the for the book. <laughs> for it was even the church. That's an official figure, thirty-five thousand, more or less. Okay, I see. I'm going to get stuck on a tangent here, but what, what's interesting is there was the original schism in the church, right? That that created the Eastern Orthodox and ultimately Catholicism. Yeah, yeah. and then it just kept branching mm. out. Mm. And I think it's similar to what's going on in terms of ideas. Yeah. Ex especially nowadays with things like, I, I hate to bring this up. But it's quite a cliche now, really, but anti-vaxxers and vaxxers, mm -hmm. you know, people right. that are for it and against it. And mm -hmm. then you have a place like the United States and the previous president was an isolationist. Yeah. So we're always going to like, the goal ultimately is us to work as a collective. You know, yeah, the, but I mean, I, I think if you if you look at isolationists or anti-vaxxers or I mean, to take a take it to its extreme level, you know, flat earthers, if you like. I mean, sort of yes, uh, you can have that opinion, but unless you can back it up with something that makes sense, then it, it's. I'm going to have trouble going along with you. You know, I mean, you can say, oh, I don't feel, yeah, the earth looks flat to me. Uh, I, I, I'm going to live as if the earth is flat. Well, yeah, you can. I mean, that's fine. It probably won't make much difference to most of your life. But actually, the reasons why we know that the earth is not flat are very clear. <laughs> and if you made the slightest effort to go into it, you could figure out exactly why we know that that's not the case. And and the same with, with vaccines. I mean, the reasons why they are being advocated is very clear because we know how viruses work and we know that we know how the immune system works and this is the way we have used in all medicine right through from the first guys who invented sort of inoculation although well, it apparently came from turkey i thought it was an english thing but apparently it was stolen from the turks they had the first idea and i wouldn't be surprised if people knew about it before in terms of using germs just to yeah, kind of give yeah. you an immunization. But anyway, I mean, the principle of it is so well established that if you're going to chuck that out, then it's like, well, what else are you going to chuck out here? I mean, uh, why are you watching television? Excuse me. What's that? That's um, it's sort of how do you why do you trust that yeah. when you don't yeah. trust this other stuff? I mean, what it, it doesn't make sense that the the, uh, the logic of it, there is no logic, It's a, but it's a feeling and, and it's more to do not so much with that as, as a feeling of frustration with with the system and that's a totally different conversation i mean if one were to go into sort of yeah you know brexit or you know trump isolationism and all those things that that's that's a different conversation but it's more like a sort of an emotional reaction that sort of disables your your logic sort of last time we talked about cognitive dissonance yeah and how I said that, you know, well, we, we said that that's important, but mm -hmm. I should, what I should have clarified and said, when you experience cognitive dissonance, mm -hmm. that means that whatever understanding that you had, what you're now experiencing, seeing, understanding, learning doesn't fit the schema. You yeah. have the choice to yeah. either reject what is clearly self-evident in front of you. Yeah. or integrate it. So you can reject it or you can integrate it. I yeah. think that sounds, yeah. that's kind of the choice that I see. Well, and obviously, yeah. go ahead. I was just going to say, I've been thinking about this recently with the with the COVID thing and, you know, this new variant that's coming up now, the, the Omicron or whatever it is. It's like, okay, so th this, is, this is evolution in action. You know, for all those people who don't believe in evolution, <laughs> this actually is evolution happening because yeah you know every generation of any biological thing you get a little mutation somewhere and if one mutation is slightly better than than all the others in that generation that's surviving that will eventually become the dominant form in that thing now 
for most of, I mean, certainly in humans, we don't live long enough to see that happening, not in our real lives. And that's why, you know, when they work on this stuff in labs, they use fruit flies and things that reproduce really yeah. fast yeah. so you can sort of yeah. see the changes happening in real time. So we're looking at a virus that is, is mutating in real time right in front of us. And so now you've got this one that's got like 30 different mutations on the spike protein or something. And you think, okay, so if that's not evolution, how are you going to explain that? <laughs> Excuse me. Is, is, is God sitting around thinking, hmm, let's see, I can really cause them some problems. Let's put 32 different mutations on that one and see what happens. I mean, what? It's a, this, this is actual living proof right in front of our eyes that evolution is, is a theory that explains what's happening in the world. And if, and if you don't think that, then it's down to you to explain it. Really. Cognitive dissonance, big time. I mean, who well, did it? <laughs> well, Harriet Tubman, uh, incredible woman of history, person of history. She said she she freed slaves from from the South and brought them to Canada, yeah. and uh, she was known to have said that you know what about the people that won't come with us? She would say, "You can't." Some I'm paraphrasing here, but words the effect of some people can't be changed and you can't force change on people yeah. and they're going to sink the ship if you try to force them. So you got to keep going. Yeah. You got to keep going. And I kind of wonder if that's sort of the direction well, that we're going here. I don't know. I always like, there's a great French expression to, which means, you know, to take one step back in order to take two steps forward, to jump two steps forward. I, I sort of think, we don't just move in a nice straight progression that it's like, oh, now we're going to get, you know, it's, it's better and better and better. Or it doesn't work like that. And I think, I mean, just take Brexit, which is the big issue in my country. I mean, I think that was, you know, literally, we didn't take the people with us and they sank the ship. I mean, that's, that would be my way of looking at it, which is obviously not one that would be shared by Brexiteers. But I, I, would, I would venture to predict that within another generation, we will in some form or another be back in some form or another of yeah. the European Union, because what else are you going to do? I mean, this is this is the problem with it. It's like, okay, so now you're isolated. Now, guess what? You're still living on the globe. And guess what? You still got to interact with everybody else. And guess what? You can't fight them because it doesn't work. You know, even if we thought it did, just look at what happened in Afghanistan and everywhere else. That doesn't work. So we got to talk to people. We got to have a way of working it out. So what's your answer? I mean, it's just everybody withdraws into the imaginary past that they think work better. But number one, it didn't work all that well, or we wouldn't, we'd still be there. And, then, and number two, you, you know, you, you can't, we're here now, so you can't go backwards. And it's up to them to explain how, how it's going to work. And, and you never get that kind of detail from them. It's always sort of, we're just going to withdraw and be us. No, I don't think so. And there's there's so many things that fly in the face of that. For example, the global economy, right? So yeah. what? You're just going to start growing turnips and uh, exactly. run off your own dairy for the right? Like, no, it doesn't work that way. Well, like, that's where this it is why we don't have to 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 wage wars. This is actually how we fight wars now: is just tariffs and sanctions, and you know, on exported goods. Yeah, right now. Yeah. There's yeah. a, a apparently in, in, in Canada, in eastern Canada, there's what's called a maple syrup war going on. Right now. <laughs> yeah. I'm not making I, this up, man. I no, wish I, I'm not that smart. Well, hey, there's some of the stuff that's going down in Northern Ireland because of our Brexit issue with the sort of the sausage wars and the processed meat wars and the, you know, the stuff that they can't do because they got themselves into a legal twist. I mean, it, they didn't realize the implications of what they were doing. And now, of course, as many people said at the time, okay, if you're going to pull out of Europe, so, okay, there was this thing, we were trying to make it all work together. Now we're pulling out because we want to have our sovereignty back and all that. So, so okay, now Scotland wants to pull out of the UK. Oh, no, they can't do that. Well, so, well yeah, but the same reason, they want to have their own sovereignty. Oh, that's different, though. No, that's different. No, 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 this is the United Kingdom. It's like, no, it's not different. It's the same thing. It's just Because <laughs> where does it stop? You know, okay, so now... Okay, Cheltenham wants to be independent. It's a little town in the middle of nowhere because it wants to have its sovereignty back. No, you know, it just, that's, 
we didn't stay there because there is synergy in working together. That's the whole thing. I mean, all this technology you're talking about, you and me doing this right now. I mean, this is beyond the wildest dreams of our parents oh, you know, perfect. that we could do yeah. this. But we are literally bringing the world together. You know, I mean, you're, you know, what, 5,000 miles away from me, something like that. It's crazy. We're just here right now and we're sharing information. And so the idea that you can withdraw into your room and suck your thumb and just sort of grow your own turnips, I mean, duh, really? Good luck with that. And maybe you have to try. Sometimes you have to do that to just realize how stupid it was. But unfortunately, you, you take the shit down with you, as you said earlier. That's the problem. And and you read uh, you read Sapiens, obviously. Yeah. That was one of the books that you mentioned. He talks about the sort of – he uses the Faustian deal, which yeah, yeah, yeah. he gives it negative implications mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the Faust deal with the devil. But yeah. – um, he talks about agriculture, the agricultural revolution, right. and how right. we wouldn't have even, like, we just do the system, and it wouldn't yeah. matter if it was two generations in or a hundred generations in. We're now, like, it's inseparable. Hmm. And now, wh where we are right now, I would say, is rather inseparable. And try as we may to disentangle ourselves, yeah. it's just going to result in a completely, it's going to result in new problems. Yeah. The well, I mean, thing, the problem, go on. Well, I was going to say the other thing too is that when you talked about evolution, and evolution mm. does take time. That's why look at fruit flies, right? It's much faster. Mm. But the brains that we have, biologically speaking, are mm. the same brains that ten thousand years ago our ancestors had. All that's well, changed. Yeah. Well, of course, there's been change, but with our prefrontal cortex, that's the most recent part to evolve. Yeah, probably about two hundred and fifty thousand years ago, probably. When, when oh, yeah. Came. See, yeah. I was, yeah. I was being no, incredibly no. conservative with my numbers. <laughs> no, what you're saying is about you know when we started agriculture, which is when the whole civilization thing took off, really, because before that we, you know, we just didn't have the means. We didn't have any extra. We didn't really surplus, basically. So we we spent all our time looking for food. That's that's basically how we were living. But. Um, there is some evidence, by the way, just on that point, that our brains are actually getting smaller. Have the hippocampus slightly smaller since we reached our peak of brain power. That that since since uh, we domesticated ourselves, because domestic animals, their brains are slightly smaller. They get smaller than the wild animals that they came from originally, because. Whoa. They don't need to think about stuff. Well, you know, we're they pruning don't... things. We're pruning things. Well, it's more like wild animals have got to go out and look for food all the time. They, yeah. They've got to be yeah. checking stuff out and thinking and really, you know, on their toes the entire time. Whereas domestic animals just, there's a bucket over there with food in it. Hey, I don't have to think about that. Okay, I won't. So, you know, what you, what you, you know, use it or lose it kind of thing. So there's there's some evidence that, that modern human brains are slightly smaller than they used to be, but. <laughs> and I, I heard it was a hippocampus. So, so, so yeah. to that point, you know, we're say it's, it's decreasing in size based mm -hmm. on the security of our environment. Right. Possibly that's a correlation. Possibly. But yeah. my point though, is going to be that we have the same brains that, that our ancestors had before even the agricultural revolution, yeah. which I think is why we can be so susceptible to, to like mass mania and things like that. Right. Like everybody's doing it. We're social beings. So I think, and you mentioned this, that the antidote to this is dialogue, mm -hmm. right? Like when people are talking, they're not fighting. Yeah. And with people like flat earthers with, you know, X, Y, Z, let's not even name names here, but just with anybody who sees the world differently than us, if we take that step back and we have a conversation, then we can begin to move forward. Yeah. The problem is, is that so many people I try to encourage conversation with, let's just use anti-vaxxers. I say, well, let's talk about this because people are talking about it we need to have a civil discourse so many times i hear well let's talk about something else i don't want to talk about it really? are you kidding me this is the only thing that you post on your media right like this is all that you talk about but i want to have this civil conversation with you because that's the only way as a society 
that we're yeah. going to move forward, right? Yeah. Other people are saying, you know, there's there's the whole um, exceptionalism, like man, and academia is nefarious for this, mm-hmm. you know, just saying like, oh, these why can't these idiots get it? You know, they don't say that, but they, it's implicit, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, as a society, if we are going to move forward, if we are going to survive, we have, we have got to start everyone. talking. We have to take everyone with us. We do. Yeah. The problem is that we don't, we, we've, you know, systematically, well, I don't know about systematically, but um, I don't know about in Canada, but, you know, the, the standards of uh, education in terms of the amount of energy and, well, also investment in education, in public education has, has definitely dwindled, I would say. I mean, just in terms of the status of teachers, I was just talking about this with my wife the other night because she's from Japan, and in Japan, a teacher is still a highly respected member of society, right? Yeah. Now, that was the case when I was a kid, basically. Teachers were, wow, teachers. You know? But now it seems like teachers, well, I mean, for a start, they never get paid anything. I mean, I don't know what it's like with public education in, in Canada, but it's like... It's, I not, it's not a real paid job. Oh well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. As you know, it's not it's not a highly paid job, and it's it's very demanding. And and yet we don't sort of give people teachers the support, or they don't get the respect. I don't know. Do you? Well, maybe you do. You tell me tell me different. But I think what I'm trying to say is that I think that we're not putting enough effort into education, which is really the key to the whole thing. I mean, if people don't know anything, then they're prey to what they just feel, you know. And what you feel is important. Of course, what you you feel is important. You should always be in connection with your your sort of your deeper instincts. But you also need to understand that you can be wrong, you know. Yes. The, the, there's things that I mean. The flat Earth is the is the obvious thing. But we went from these things which we thought were we felt were true. And then we understood that they weren't. And the reason we understood that they weren't was because we had information, that information spread. And, you know, to begin with, it was just word of mouth. And word of mouth, you can't really trust word of mouth because maybe this guy heard it wrong or whatever. And then, you know, then you get to writing, suddenly writing. Suddenly it's written down and you've got something you can rely on a little bit. And then you get to printing. The printing thing was the thing that's just astonishing. I mean, the Sapiens, it doesn't mention it in Sapiens, but to me that's, you know, he talks about the scientific revolution being something that, you know, people just woke up one day and realized they were ignorant. <laughs> I, 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 no, literally, he does say that. You can check it. I could, I could find the page. But um, it's sort of, no, it wasn't that. It's that we didn't have any information. Like, mm. until Gutenberg, the, they estimate there was something like 30,000 books in Europe. Yes. Not, 30, not 37 different books, 30,000 books total in all of Europe. And, within, and just look behind you. Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> but I mean, within within 50 years, there were 10 million books in Europe. Now tell me that didn't have some effect on what people knew, you know? That's just boom, right there. But the, the other thing that I think is often overlooked is the rates of literacy. So yes, all these mm-hmm. books were readily available. And I still think that with the Gutenberg Press, it was like... Um, there was, there was this recent Tom Hanks movie and mm. news from the world. I think it's called Anyways, okay. it's, I've, I've forgotten. I've forgotten most of it, but anyways, what he does is he goes around to towns and he reads newspapers in the right. 19th century post civil oh, okay. war. And, and this is the idea that literacy rates were not very high until the 20th century. Yeah. So the way the information was, there was still a lot of gatekeepers of literacy. In fact, before the 20th century, the highest, the most literate place on the earth, or one of the most literate nations of the earth, was Hawaii. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Cool Why fact. Uh, because mis- missionaries came there and they they taught. In yeah. fact, the Hawaiian Bible, mm. they couldn't translate it from English to Hawaiian. They had to translate it from the original Hebrew, you're going to like this, to the Hawaiian language, which really? tells you about. Wow like the that must have been a that really, was a really niche group of people who could do that jesus from yeah. hebrew to, yeah wow it's it's mm. from the book captive paradise wonderful okay. book huh. uh, yeah it's like i said no ideas are 
I don't have any new ideas. I just regurgitate what I hear. Anyways. Hey, look, look behind me, you know, it's like. Yeah, exactly. Well, look, look to the right. side. Like, look. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, yeah. to your point, education, I think that we we're taking it for granted that we're literate. Mm. Yes. Yeah. I think that's the problem because you go to places in the world and education is deeply like there's revenants yeah. for education here. Yeah. It's politicized. I'm sorry, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. post secondary um, universities, there's heavy politicization. I'm not saying that they're wrong in their angles, mm. but it is, like I said, it's a one-sided. I'm seeing a very one-sided argument in from academia. Right. In what? Okay. So what? 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 What side are they on? Well, how do you see it? Well, I, it's the side that I mean I happen to be on myself, but <laughs> it's. But I, I I'm being aware of my own bias, but it yeah. it is highly you know left, and this is the way it's supposed to be, and it's. That's the issue. This is the way it's supposed to be is the issue. I mean, I, I think I think, you know, about it being left. I mean, they talk about a liberal bias in the media and all that, which which we could have another conversation about because it doesn't look that way to me. If you look at some of the tabloids that we feed on in this country, it's hardly a left wing bias there, quite the reverse. But in terms of academia or the people who work in the media, generally speaking, do tend to seem to to dress left, if you like, in terms of um, their their way of thinking about things. Now, you know, people on the right will say, "Oh, they're just brainwashed." You know, it's and, and it's like, well, that's one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it is, you know, they they they've thought about it a lot more. <laughs> they've read a lot more, and mm -hmm. you know, in terms of, I think the issue that you really have to address is politically, if we want to go political, it's like you've got, say. Um, socialism on the one hand yes and and you know untrammeled capitalism on the other side so it's like do you do you are you going to sort of go with the people who say grab what you can for yourself and screw everybody else or are you going to say well no no we should we should distribute the wealth that we have and we've earned together because we live in a society we should distribute that out make it available to other people so those are the two extremes yes. but if you're actually thinking how does this all work in terms of how do, how does the world work together? Then clearly, you need to have some means of helping everybody have a certain basic standard of of, of life. Otherwise, the whole thing's going to go down the tubes. It seems to me that that is a conclusion you would come you would come to, unless your entire focus was what's best for me, right? If what's best for me is be as rich as I possibly can, right? Just do what it takes to grab all the money and stuff I can and sod everybody else. So I'm not paying any taxes. Why should I? You know, why am I going to pay some lazy fuck who doesn't even read? I'm just going to take that money and do what I want with it. That's a position you can take. On the other hand, we're back to isolation, Mr. It's like we're, we're not in that situation. We're, we're in a situation where we need society to function, and that requires certain basic you know facilities that are available for everybody one of which could be for example to be really radical health facilities public health facilities you know that seems to be something in the states that's kind of tarred as a communist idea but basically that's just keeping society running you know oh in, in there's canada no, there's free health care well there you go it's like a no-brainer <laughs> exactly it's a no-brainer but if from an american perspective that's way off the scale left communist whatever but it, you know, so I'm I'm a little bit wary of the notion that, that that the academic community is is tends to sort of be on the left of the spectrum because because what because they're brainwashed. Okay, so they're very clever people, but they're so clever <laughs> that they can't see that they've just been brainwashed. I mean, what what's when you pick that argument apart, it doesn't make too much sense. I think I think it's. I mean, if, if you've been brainwashed, and okay, let's have the argument. You explain to me why being Attila the Hun works out better for society as a whole, uh, and and the answer is it doesn't. You know, so you have to you have to answer that moral case, really. I'm I, I'm going to eat the devil's avocado here and say that the people on the left, or mm -hmm. let's try to avoid the the left right dichotomy mm -hmm. here. 
but yeah. academia, these are very intelligent people, but the, perhaps they're more based in theory than practicality sometimes. And I think that mm -hmm. it can be quite rich that they can explain the experiences of, of the socially uh, downtrodden. That's not the right word, but anyways, people that rely on the social system, let's just say, yeah. I can't, yeah. I can't think of a better word anyways, but the people that are relying on that, it can be very rich when some professor is telling us what they should be doing for them. What you sort of see what I'm saying. It's like, how well do they understand that perspective? Right. Right. And how much are they personally contributing? Yeah. Probably yeah. not very much. So yeah. they're, they're, it's, it's, it's easy for them to contribute, contribute somebody else's wealth. Yeah. Right. So it, but it's always easy to tell other people how to do and what to do. Right. It's true. On the other hand, you know, the debate about how do we run society, I mean, this is what politics is. I think politics is really just, it comes down to how do you apportion, you know, is, is tax stealing from those people who deserve to have that money or is tax just the, the you know, like it's a um, membership fee, if you like, you know? I, I, I think I dig that. I like that. that yeah, I know. It was somebody, somebody said this a while back and I, I thought that was a clever idea. I mean, it's like that's you're paying your dues. You know, I mean, you go out, you, you get in your car and you drive on the road and the road's not got, it's not full of potholes. Why is that? Because you pay tax. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, there are certain things that we need to ensure it, it's your membership fee. And we should look on paying tax. Everybody looks on paying tax as something as some terrible imposition that they try to avoid doing at all costs. But we should try and turn that around and say, no, there's a certain level at which it's something. It should be a point of pride. You're contributing to the to the common good here. I mean, look at some of the societies in 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 Europe. As I have to say now, since we're not part of Europe officially, you know. Which, no, on when, the when did that happen that you officially? Oh, uh, officially, when did it happen? Last about a year ago. Yeah, when was it? Yes, I think it was yes, a year ago. Twenty twenty. Went through with it. Eh? Damn, that's yeah. Good. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> we 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 elected our own sort of uh, our mini Trump and and just went for it. Yeah. What's what's that guy's name again? Not Tony Blair, but uh, it's yeah, crazy I, hair. I don't even like to say the name, but it's Boris, Boris Johnson. Yeah. yeah. Somebody wants to say, but these people are popping up more, man. We got these yeah. people in Canada. Hmm. What does that say? Again, I'm sorry to go off on all no, these separate no, it's, it's good, tangents. But, yeah. But, but really these, these like en enigmatic, you know, hmm. not to give them any credit, but that's how they're seen, right? These characters, these cults of personality why are they rising up in the West? Everywhere. The United well, States, Britain. If you don't see, Canada. I mean, I don't, I don't want to go down the left tunnel again, but I, I would say that, you know, <laughs> we've we run things so badly in the West. Um, mm. that if you, you think what's happened since the 1980s, you know, there's been a gradual or a rolling back of all the rules and regulations that regulated things. There's been an opening up of the of financial markets, and it's been open season. And on you know, anybody who's who wants to make some money can can make as much yeah. as they like, and and that's kind of been licensed as as an acceptable lifestyle. And I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with going out and making money, but there is something wrong with abandoning the rest of society and just not investing in education, not investing in public facilities, not investing in helping the community that that's bad so i mean certainly in the uk you've got a whole chunk of the population that got left behind and they're pissed and i don't blame them for being pissed you know? and so if somebody comes along and goes we're going to make this country great again you know we're going to take our country back take back control and they make what they say all these things and people go yeah that's what we that's what we need we need to go back to where we were but we ain't where we were and the only way you're going to get back to where we were is is if you start investing, like Biden is is doing. I'm not as well informed on this as I should be, but I, I gather that's what he's trying to do is, is to spend money on the infrastructure and and you know in, have a, a kind of new deal basically to build the country back up, put some money into the country. That's what we desperately need in this country. And Boris is sort of saying he's going to do it, but when it comes to it, he ain't doing it. You know, 
So, I mean, it's easy to say stuff that appeals to people's sense of frustration and the feeling that they've lost all that greatness that they had, but it's not as easy as that. So I figure you, they did, we need to learn the hard way. The question is how much of the ship has to sink before we, we realize that's, that's the problem. And, and, and there's a name from this when, when we're cutting from, because that's what, it, that's what it's resulting in is cutting, taking yeah. money away from public austerity, uh, austerity, austerity economics. And yeah. dude, that's happening here in yeah. Canada with education. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Absolutely. And, and the real measurement, I mean, I'm going to sound so cheesy as a teacher here, but the real measurement of a nation is in their education not yeah. in the military i mean obviously Absolutely. you need a military duh yeah. but that's that's how you invest in the future that's as uh yeah. as yuval harari said that's your yeah. original 401k is your children that's it that's it and, and what you can... mm. oh just and, and the education that you can give them the information that you can give them just this pass on what's known otherwise otherwise you're just endlessly reinventing the wheel you know it's like You've got to set out again and go, oh, I wonder if the earth is flat. Is it really flat? Mm, let's see. And you, you've got to spend another 2,000 years figuring that out. I mean, no, come on. Just the whole point of education is to bring us up to speed with what we think we know and then, then deal with the new set of cognitive distances that then occur right. at that level because it's never a done deal. It's never finished. You know, There's always just what we know and then the stuff that we don't know. So you, you've got to take it to the wherever interests you really, I guess, you know. So this incredible tool, language, mm. here we are, we're in the year 2021. We're seeing these problems arise. How can we use the tool that we've been given to its complete utility in solving some of these problems? Um. I refer you to my previous answer, as they say in, in Parliament. I, it's, it's the UN thing for me. Is the, is the huge, huge, huge elephant That's in it. the room. We've got to say, because even if you say, I'm going to withdraw into my little country, okay, everybody withdraws into their country, then what? How do you deal with this thing? How do you actually, how do we deal with, well, with climate change? I mean, let's say it gets, I mean, and I'm prepared to, I'm prepared to give some slack to the people who say, Oh, it's not man-made. It's just, you know, it's happening anyway. Well, yeah, it's happening anyway. You've still got to deal with it. It doesn't really matter whether it's man-made or not. So how are we going to deal with something that affects the whole globe without us all discussing it? We've got to make, we've got to make a case and we've all got to sign off on it. You know, I mean, if it means putting like sulfur aerosols in the sky to absorb the the sunlight so that it doesn't cools the earth down or whatever it is if it's something invasive like that or growing algae in the sea to absorb co2 or some kind of like really large global engineering solution which we might have to go to if it starts to get too hot then somebody's got to sign off on that we can't just do that we we have to have a forum to discuss it in and that's what the un is supposed to be, but ain't for the reasons we, we discussed earlier. So that's, 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 if I could move this whole thing forward, just one little notch, that would be the notch I'd like to move it forward on more than anything else. You know, are, are human beings the problem or the solution? Huh. I, you know, I, I refer you to, to presentism. We are, <laughs> we, we, we are what we are. <laughs> I mean, they're both. It's like language. Is language the problem or the solution? It's both. You know, um, yeah, yeah. it's how you use the tool. I mean, do you about, think? No, go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm ready for another question. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, the evolution, the trajectory that we're on. We watch science fiction shows, things like that. Will there yeah. ever be like, for example, Latin is a dead language mm -hmm. and it's used in science, right? As, right. as you know, this sure. is the no universal McClatch. term for this thing. Yeah, yeah. No McClatch. Yeah. Will there ever, do you, do you think we're going in a direction when we will have a shared global language? Probably. 
Well, I mean, we're pretty much there already. I mean, English is sort of de facto a global language right now. And it might shift. It might we probably not going to Chinese because Chinese is not widely enough spoken outside of China at the moment. However, if we do get, I, I don't know, it's it's possible that Chinese might take over, for example. But your question is, are we going to go to a, a single global language? Uh, if we don't destroy ourselves in the meantime, I think we will. Yes, I probably we will. I mean, we'll retain local languages as well, but, but essentially we'll will have a working language that uh, then will become something that everybody gets on board with, probably. And there'll be sort of back and forth on that. There'll be, you know, people who go who want to go and learn their own, go back to sort of, you know, ancient languages and so forth. But that will ultimately not be practical, I think, mm -hmm. if you're asking. <laughs> you, you, you mentioned China and one sort of, have you heard of the the, the Uyghurs in Ch I hope yeah, I'm saying that right. Uyghurs, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uyghurs. Well, Uyghurs. I don't know what they, say, what they say in China, but uh, yeah. People talk about this one road policy, things like that, and I wonder, like, yes, China is an economic powerhouse at this moment in time, hmm. but I wonder if their downfall will also be what what precipitated their their rise to such power, and that's their monoculture. And you talk about that in your book. I mean, when you try to like, you know, thumb people down and say, no, 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 yeah. no this is the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. I actually think that that, that could be your ultimate downfall. Yeah, I think I, I that's the really interesting thing about China. And, and I, I don't know if we'll see it in our lifetimes, um, but it's hard to see how it can, although, I mean, China all through history kind of worked a bit like that because they had an imperial system and they had a very, very, you know, uh, sophisticated bureaucracy that was basically a one party system. So if you were a clever kid, you could take the entrance exams and you could join the, you know, the Mandarin system and you, you become part of the government. And in theory that that's, you know, if you have a, a benevolent dictator or a benevolent emperor who's really wants to look after his people and sees that as his job and then a one party system could work but history tends to show that it, that it doesn't you know yeah. sooner or later you get somebody who's just taking all for himself and the, the rest of the country can just look after themselves so i don't know i i, I mean just on a theoretical basis i i don't really see how that system works out better than democracy because it's just unstable you know it, it's liable to at any point collapse on itself so i i don't know where china's going it's uh doesn't look too good at the moment <laughs> in terms of their you know they just elected president xi to be life president and he's you know whenever they discuss anything at those party meetings it's like so we're going to do this and they'll go yep you know there aren't too many, there aren't too many dissenting voices there so and it cannot be that they all agree with that so We'll see. I mean, look at famous examples throughout history. Bay of Pigs, the, mm. the failed invasion of the play, Bay of Pigs. Everybody, they're all like, yeah, this is a good idea. It was a little bit different. They were just all like, nobody was saying anything. They all thought, this is a great idea. And then yeah. failure. Yeah. I mean, that again, there's, there's language again. That counterculture, mm. I believe, is what strength strengthens the dominant culture it's like a sieve right maybe not everything will get through yeah but some things will and yeah. it's actually going to make for a progressive society i mean you need counterculture that's right you know um synthesis and antithesis or whatever it is it's like you you need you need to have you know something and then it's opposite and then they the synthesis is it takes the best of both and you move on that that's that's the progression of in intelligence really so if you're preventing that from happening that can't be healthy but it's if you've got an army backing it up and a police state that just jumps on anybody who says something you don't like then that's that's uh it's pretty harsh for the duration i always like the expression the castle the castle falls from from within you know 
but it might take a long time to do it. That's the only problem. The old African proverb, if there is no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. yeah. In terms of counterculture, this is a totally subjective question. And you talk about it a little bit in your book. What is the 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 most I try to avoid value statements here, but what's the strongest form of a counterculture in progressing something? So is it you know dance? Is it theater? Mm -hmm. Is it film? Is it oh. you know, what is it? That's an interesting question. Um you you are you really asking what's the most powerful form of expressing a a counter position is that what you're how, how do you get yeah. how do you get that 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 could be that is the most likely to be uh osmosified or diffused into the society okay well i think as of now it's probably not books <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll say that i mean i think books are probably on the way out that's what McLuhan said you know he said that you know we went from being a tactile visual and an audio you know species and then we invented writing and we went through this period of having books because that was that was a more efficient way of doing it but now we've invented video and and you know we can we can do the whole thing like that so i mean i don't know film i think done right is is a very powerful means of engagement because you, it's all immersive you know, you, you just mm. go and see a good film and you're completely taken by it. Um, I want to believe in books. I want to believe in this book. Hey, who? Oh, there it is. Yeah. And <laughs> because the thing about books is you can you can you can just go back to them and, and reflect on them and, and think it over and reread it. And it's it's a slower process and it's probably sort of more uh, conducive to um, educational thought should we say the, the trouble with film or anything like that is that, that it's sort of it's it can be very you know an, it can pack an emotive punch and it can move you in a certain direction but it it doesn't necessarily not necessarily the right vehicle for giving you all the information you might need yeah. you know so you've always got to go back and and and, and do a little bit of the work you know, you've got to kind of you got to have the question, really. The question is the key, always. It's like, once you have a question, then you want to look for an answer. And that, that's that's how you change anything. If you don't have a question, you're not even going to look for an answer. Even if the answer is shown to you, if you are not thinking that there's a question, you won't even notice. So whatever can raise the question, I think. So that doesn't really answer you particularly, but um i'm not sure there's a particular format i mean it, it, and it, again it depend on you i mean for me music was a hugely opening thing it just uh uh it connected me with with, with a, a world outside of the one i appeared to be experiencing through my rather narrow upbringing which didn't sort of offer too many alternatives and suddenly music was like wow there's a whole different world out there you know so but for different people, my, my wife is an artist. She's art is the thing that gets her, and you know, academics read books. So I don't think there's a one size fits all answer. Is what I'm saying. I in your book you say, again, I'm paraphrasing something along. If you want to get out of your comfort zone or or, or mm -hmm. that narrow vision, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, more, it's not so much that. It's more that that that's it's going to be a um a way for you to connect with a wider spectrum of things that yes. you might otherwise have thought were were normal you know but you but it really does get you out out of like yeah you know the blinders got to get out of it to get myself into it yeah as they as the, that's the that's the quote i think on that chapter okay. and, <laughs> and and for yourself and I got to get into it to get myself out of it. That's the that's the story. <laughs> that's a, it's a famous Frank Zappa song. Got to get into it to get myself out of it. And I got to get out of it to get myself into it. Mm. That's the uh, the paradox. Right. <laughs> and life is 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 you know 
there's something that we love about contradictions, especially in things like comedy. But mm, yeah. the the other one though is is like for me, I think it's music. Like you just you you talk a lot about John Lennon, John Lennon, excuse me. Imagine, you know, imagine peace. You talk about yeah. that that piece of work that you worked on in Iceland yeah. and translating it. Um, but I think music has been because it's so subtle. I mm -hmm. think in the messages. Now I'm going to sound very crotchety in saying that, like the music I listen to nowadays, I'm trying to understand, like, what is the purpose here, or has this been completely engineered by people just trying to make profit out of it? Like, what is it the product? As Mr. Zappi used to say, is it just product, or is it something that somebody yeah. genuinely trying to say something through? You know? Yeah. And you, you and you look at Spotify and things like that. It's like nobody buys records nowadays. But yeah. man, I own vinyl records, and it's like you—that's an experience. And and uh, Marshall McLuhan he talked about hot and cold media, and how hot media. I think he it can be hypnotic, like to its pressed down, and mm -hmm. cold media can be hallucinogenic, right? When right. pushed down to its it's medium. And I thought that was really fascinating and how the, the hot, like hot media, it's like chemical speed up, right? You think about particles, the faster things move, they evaporate, turn into gas, the slower mm -hmm. they are, the further apart the particles, they become solid. So, right, so right, forth. Right, right. I wonder if so much of what we're consuming and you talk about memes, I feel like that's hot media. Like it's just so mm. constant. It's like we don't even have time to digest it in mm. terms of news feed and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Would you Would you agree that that's where we are with our media consumption, or what's your? My kids are always talking about it. And, you know, they're just sort of drowning in the in the, the sort of information overload that that's, that's there and. I guess that's true to the extent that you, I mean, I've, I've recently, as a, as a sort of shameless attempt to try and get my books and publicity, I've, I've taken to social media and I'm, I'm beginning to see what they mean in terms of the amount of, uh, just the amount of traffic that you have to deal with. If you if you put something up on, on any form of social media, then it gets traffic and you've got to pay attention to it and then you hear different stuff and you've got to check it all out and it's it's, it's almost you're, you're not in control anymore of, of what it is that you really are interested in and want to, to to look for you know you've got to deal with all this peripheral stuff you've, you've got to almost like sort of shut down the other dialogues in your head before you can get back into connection with with, with where you are so i don't know um I think if you it it, it can it, it it looks as though there's an addictive element to it, you know, and and that's maybe the issue you, have, you just have to watch. It's like how much time you're actually spending doing that vis-a-vis. -vis. Wait a minute, what am I? What do I really need to know here? What am I? What what's what are the contradictions that I'm facing in my own life? What's the issue that I need to be digging into? What's the question? Again, it's always what's the question. So I think you can focus on that, then that gives you something to be to focus on. Really, you need something to have a, have a, a center that you can. I mean, I was saying to my kids, it's like, what do you, what do you, what do you really want out of what you're doing? What is the thing that's actually providing you with the most satisfaction out of what you're doing, other than just making money and the fact that it's a job? But you know, just try and find that thing that that's really at the heart of what gets to you. Which is where we get back to feeling. You know, you were saying earlier on you want to talk about feeling. Well, feeling is you know very very important to us. It's it's that's that's the sort of the way we put it all together. Language is the distraction in a sense. So, which came first, feeling or language? Feeling. All animals have feeling. You know, I mean, maybe even a little amoeba has feeling. I mean, they do move around. They move around from you know spot to spot. So why do they move around? They must move, they must get a feeling. You know, they must go mm, a little bit more, a little bit more food over there. It feels good. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if 
I mean, what I I wanted to write. I had an idea for writing a, a let's say, or maybe a, I don't know, might turn into something longer, but just sort of the idea of rust. You know, you put iron out in the in in the air and, and rain, and it and it rusts, right? So why does it rust? It rusts because the oxygen and the iron feel more comfortable if they're together, right? No, I, won't, I won't go into the chemistry of it, but the energy levels, are, um, it's more, they're more relaxed if they're together, right? So do they, feel, do they feel that? Is that something that they feel, that they feel better that way? Or, you know, I mean, maybe they do. Maybe it starts right from there. I think feeling feeling is, is just a part of being, being part of this universe. <laughs> it's all about energy levels, you know? Really. So, 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 this might not be an answerable question. Why do we feel? Not an answerable question, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> just be like, just be glad that you do. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I think, I think that's, that's just the base you build on. You do feel, you know, you wake up in the morning and feeling. Mm -hmm. That's it. Um, I mean, you could, you could drill down into it. And I've been trying to recently, I've been looking into sort of, uh, you know, because the whole, everything around us is made of like, there are a certain number of elements, right? There's about 90 on, on the earth and they're all just tiny little variations of each other. And, and they're all sort of energy levels within levels and so forth, but it's about energy ultimately. So why do we feel? Because the energy within us is is or is not in balance, perhaps. Maybe that's something to do with it. I don't know. You, you've heard of the guy who did the water experiment, right? Which one's that? Oh, I can't remember. His, I, I, it's in one of my... I, I could dig it up, but anyways, well, he did makes, this... It makes the ice sort of... Um, you, you can read... Cloudy. Yeah. This, this one, he was saying that he took a glass of water... <clears throat> And he, he had a control, so he didn't do anything. And then he had two other glasses. And the one glass, he like shouted at it. It was very negative, negative energy, mm -hmm. negative vibrations. Because like you mentioned, I mean, when we speak, we're, we're really just singing to each other, right? Like, mm -hmm. hello, how are you? Versus, yeah. you know, what the hell, right? Like, I don't, I, I could speak any language to know when someone's mm -hmm. cursing my mother. Anyways, sure. so, so he has the one glass control negative to the other one positive to the other one now obviously water can't speak english or japanese i think it was japanese anyways after i guess a month he looks at the particles within the water the control one is normal the um the one that he spoke nicely to is clearer more clear and the other one was cloudy mm. I wouldn't, There's that feeling. I, I, I need to, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, I need to look at that sort of in more detail, but in, in principle, I would, uh, I would um, think that might be possible. I mean, I, I remember doing this thing with a. This is really weird, but when I was a kid, I was into the pyramids and stuff like that, and there was this thing about if you make a pyramid and you put a piece of meat right in the center of the pyramid, it will the energy that is just by having a pyramid there somehow makes the energies concentrate on this piece of meat in such a way that it preserves it better than if you just slung a piece of meat in a box. I remember making this cardboard pyramid and I put this piece of meat in the place where they, it was supposed to be the center, right? And then I left it and went on holiday and I, I, I left a control piece of meat in a shoe box, right? How, how old were you, Simon? Uh, I'm probably about 15, something like that, 16, maybe. And uh, you're a beautiful man. I love you. doing this when you're 15. Anyway, so you, you I have did to control it. I did this, and we went on holiday, a couple of weeks, come back, and geez, the piece of meat in the pyramid is dry, and the piece in the shoebox is it's got flies on it. It's rotten, rotting, and you think, whoa, this is this is weird same bits of meat and so i don't know i really don't know i mean that's a rabbit hole i don't i don't go down too far very often but you know because because you know if you lift the lid on that there's all kinds of weirdnesses out there 
I love but I mean, lids. But it's ultimately energy. If we're going to where does feeling come from, it's got to be energy. But then what is energy? Ooh, you see, Rob, there's no bottom <laughs> to this one. There's questions all the way down, I tell you. No, turtles all the way down. No, questions all the way down. <laughs> how, how has language affected or changed feeling? I mean, this is a big question, obviously. No, well, it's dislocated it, you from your feeling. That's the, that's the whole thing. It takes you... I mean, all this time that we've been talking and we've just traveled all around the world several times and the back end of the universe and whatever, and you haven't probably thought very much about your, you know, your stomach, for example, and whether you're hungry or not. That that's you know you, you haven't thought about that because we've been we've been in an abstract world. Language is an abstraction from feeling, so it just it has the ability to just take you into on a, on a wonderful journey, you know. Of con called consciousness, you know, where you can be aware of things and know that you know things. That's that's the wonderful thing. That's the, I don't know if you read that bit or remember reading that bit in chapter the four about um, how awareness and con consciousness. That the difference that I the distinction right. I make yeah. between them because awareness is. I mean, what we're talking about feeling is awareness essentially. It's just yeah. awareness. Now, what's awareness? I don't know, but I am aware. You know, but when you get to words words allow you to by giving a name to your various awarenesses then you can, can become aware that you are aware i think the process of consciousness is is intimately tied up with language because if we weren't able to speak at all i'd be just looking at you and you'd be looking at me and it's like we might be figuring out do you think i could knock him down and get to his refrigerator or, or whatever, or probably not even that. Can I kill him and cut his arm off and eat it or something? I mean, what else are we going to do? There's no, there's this, you know, we, we have no means of really sharing any of our experience without, without this. I mean, we are kind of like howling at each other. It's like, oh, we can get a little bit of that, but, really not very much it's, it's only when i'm chopping up that howling with little digital clusters that we're able to actually understand each other right because if i switched into japanese you would suddenly not be you'd still be hearing the howling but yeah <laughs> So, so even though I had no idea what you said, mm. because I was following what you're saying, I feel like you said, if I speak like this, you have no idea what I'm saying. Yeah, that's pretty much what I was saying. You, see, you got it. Pretty good. On the other hand, if I start talking about quantum physics, you might have more trouble. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. But, but you might but have that, more. Yeah. That, that's why I, one of my favorite things in my job is when I'm, I'm working with an interpreter. There's a, right. there's a family that's oh, saying, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, just because there's a multitude of different um, yes. backgrounds and families yeah. in, in our school. And for example, there's Punjabi cultures, families, and there's Cantonese families. And I, I always make sure, like, I'm not, I'm not like looking at the interpreter translate for me. Like, I'm looking at the person. Absolutely and, the right thing to do, by the way. Yes. And, but it's, uh, it's, truly a beautiful like words can't express how wonderful but like how fortunate i am to have that experience because you're there it is language right do they do, they do simultaneous for you ever like where the person is speaking and the interpreter is speaking to you no. oh okay that's 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 another wonderful experience that that jumps it up a level so, so, so as they're speaking, it's being translated. Like, yeah, the interpreter is hearing what they're saying, and they're speaking what they're saying at the same time as they're hearing it. If you see what I mean. What What normally happens is they the interpreter listens. Yeah. And then usually they 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 kind of summarize what's being said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's what they call cons consecutive interpreting. It means you know that. Mm. There'll be a bit of language, and then they'll do the translation. Then there'll be a bit of language in the translation. So it's one follows the other. Whereas simultaneous interpreting is, like I said, simultaneous. You know? Yes. 
Which what's, is a harder trick. And but I feel like that would be distracting though, because I, I do want to hear them in their mother tongue. Okay. Okay. I, I mean, I think that that's important, right? Because, because, because I, I am trying to understand them before the interpreter tells me, right? And, and how many times out of ten would you say you, you get it right? Only because I know the situation, like right. I know the pretense, right? That I right. am able to. I mean, I'm I'm not very close, but yeah. you almost. I mean, so if I went to say Mexico, which I actually can speak a bit of. Espanol, but mm. so much of what we're doing is charades, but it's mm. so it's way more engaging than if I'm talking yeah. to an, another English speaker and it's actually oh, yeah. way more intimate, right? Like yeah. when I'm, oh, yeah. cause I'm like, I'm trying to understand them in a respectful way. I'm not like, you know, why don't, why can't you speak English? It's like, you know, and, know. and, and I'm so, getting words. Yeah. It's so exciting. The first time that happens, I'm sure you will remember it because it's like the first time you have a conversation in another language that's beyond just, a few words when there's suddenly there's some back and forth even yeah. though it's kind of like really clumsy and awkward but nonetheless i'm doing this thing you know i'm having a communication in a different language it's such a wonderful thing and then then you forget all about it and it becomes natural but you know it, that that moment is just wonderful and and my favorite is with punjabi speakers is punjabi is a very distinct language in the sense that it's it's like nuanced like it's not uh superfluous in all kinds of different places in the world it's it's in kind of selective parts but my best friend growing up was punjabi so okay. i know so many words so hmm. we'll have an interpreter there and i do not look you know i look very eurocentric whatever and i'll and and i'll be a hanji and they're like you can see in their eyes like what and hanji means like okay okay i'm like hanji and and the nodding of the head and right you know no yes, no one. problem yes. you know things like and, and they're like and then after my principal who's Punjabi she's like do you do you speak Punjabi <laughs> and I'm like ah, not really but you know I know enough and she's like wow that's really cool I thought like you knew the language which I don't but anyways mm -hmm. that is a very cool experience and 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 like you say in your book is oftentimes this culture thinks the other one doesn't know anything about them and so on and so forth. Yeah. And it's such a strange dance. Yeah. But if you just get to the, the essence, the feeling of the person, yeah. you knock those barriers down. Yeah, that's it. Once you recognize them as a fellow human, you're halfway there. That's the problem. You know, I mean, it's just sort of, as I talked about in my book, it's like when I first got out of England, I, I, I just thought that we were humans and the rest of them were foreigners, you know, and it's still, and it's almost like that, almost every culture has got a word for foreigner, which means yes. not us, basically. And I love the thing in, uh, there's this, again, in the book, but there's this um, tribe in South America and they, the word oh, for yeah. themselves is straight head, right? Yeah. And the word for all foreigners is crooked head. It's sort of like we've got it, we've got it sorted out, and you guys are just all screwed up. You know? And that's what we all think. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, we even think it almost at, a, at an individual level anyway. It's so we tend to think, well, I'm right and everybody else is wrong. But you know, at a cultural level, it's it's really heavy that sort of weight upon you, the cultural weight of thinking that your way is the right way to do it. And uh lessening the burden is, is a very important part of the process i think and and i i gotta tell you simon i mean you've you've kind of sort of hit me in the head of like well of course it is but feeling think about children think about old older people yeah. right yeah. ageism but yeah. my daughter man dude she she can't skip a beat and we know that children in the first five years of their life we can't just say i love you we have to show them that and make yeah. them feel that for yeah. them to develop yeah healthfully and the same thing is true for old people like when we're like oh yeah. she doesn't get it you know she's oh, old. Yeah. and it's like dude she's right beside you <laughs> i know i know talking about people as if they weren't there that's 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 really awful yeah 
I mean, yeah. going back to energy. So he, here's another question for you. And this is where we may differ. Okay. But but you, you talked. I, I don't believe in any religion, by the way. But I do believe that there's something beyond us. Mm -hmm. That's just my philosophy. Mm -hmm. In your book, you do talk about atheism. Mm -hmm. From animism to atheism. I mean, what? Dude, I, I, I don't think I mentioned it in this recording, but... That stuck to me. Like I try to quote you all the time on that. Well, that's, animism that's, to atheism. That's that's that that's the, uh, the rainbow. Yeah, it's the trajectory. Yeah. Yeah, but but it's even going from where we were as you know primitive humans to yeah. that's the god of the tree to that yeah. you know what I mean. It just keeps expanding, expanding until it's like, ah, wait a second. Hmm. What are your beliefs after we die? What do you think happens after we die? Me personally. Yeah. Dust. Mm -hmm. To quote. Mm -hmm. To quote someone who said that once but I, I yes I, I mean that's my working assumption by which I mean if you've got stuff to do make sure you do it this time round because there may not be another time round if there is it's a bonus right but um I I'm not a I I talk about the soul in in the book quite a bit about you know like how language contributes to the idea of the soul it, it, because we because you and I, for example, we've got this conversation and, you know, after we stop talking, we'll both remember what we said. And in fact, it's going to be out there on the Internet so we can always go and check it. But even if we couldn't, you know, you always remember what people said to you or you think you remember what they said to them. You have a very strong image of your friends, right, based on language. I mean, just imagine you didn't have any language. You wouldn't really have a very strong memory of, of, of you wouldn't have a sense of who they were. So I... I think language really brings to the fore this sense, A, of you yourself, you know, and, you know, me, whatever I think I am, that's, that's sort of language is essentially driving that, that feeling. Because if I, if I was just feeling, I wouldn't be stopping to wonder about who I am, you know, I'd just be out there doing it. So language is creating the sense of a sort of an identity within me that I compare with what I know about you or anybody else that I have an inter interaction with. So language sets us up to believe that there is something there. Uh, yes. That's what I think. Now, I'm open to the idea that there might be something after death, but I don't have any concrete evidence whatsoever that I mean, people who have passed around me that we've had conversations about, you know, if there's anything out there, come back and let me know kind of stuff. And, and nobody's come back and let me know. Well, maybe I'm <laughs> sensitive to that. But, you know, how would it work is my question. Sure. How would, sure. How would it work? And I, I talk about that also in that chapter on identity. It's like, okay, if there is a soul, at what point does it get stuck into the body and at what point does it leave? And, you know, I mean, these it's like... Ah, details, you know, but yeah, details, but the devil is in the detail. You have to kind of have a, a sort of a working theory about it. So that's a long way around for saying my personal belief is that when you're done, you're done. And yeah. thank you, ma'am. It was a great ride, you know, or hopefully it was, you know. But you you, you think that there's, there's something that goes on? I mean, you know, c call me the king of wishful thinking, but... <laughs> for for well, example, okay. there is that. That's the other thing. You see, I mean, psychologically, there's plenty of motivation. Self preservation. Yeah, self preservation. Yeah, yeah. But but I have heard and I've seen. Have you ever seen someone pass die? I have. Yeah, my mother. Yeah. Yeah, I saw my dad die at 14, mm. which is oh, like wow. that's like, a shock. Like that's a that's like wow. a BCE CE kind of turning point in one's life, and to see that. I don't know, man. It was like when when it finally happens, and that something happens. That, like like we again abstract, experiential. And I have heard it say that when we die, we lose a half a pound. And it's like, what is that? Is it air or is it our energy? Well, you know. That was um. I mentioned him in the book. I've forgotten his name. He was a Scottish doctor who tried to measure that okay and, and, and in the end he couldn't <laughs> in the end 
I think you'll find that's an urban myth. Oh. But nonetheless, nonetheless, I, I yeah. recall this when my mother died. You know, I mean, she, literally, the blood drains from her face, and suddenly it's there's no question they're gone. You know. Yeah. yeah. Although she did actually fake us out for the last. She, she sort of. I thought she died, and then she suddenly spluttered back into life again, and then. Died. Was she stubborn? Was she a stubborn? She was stubborn. stubborn. I mean, it wasn't. It was no. I mean, she was not conscious, as far as I'm aware. You know, she was sort of just kind of like last breath, breaths, and then. It, but so the first time I thought she died, she hadn't, and then when she finally did die, that was very different. Oh. But I, I didn't feel that her soul yeah. disappeared up up there i mean and in terms of self-preservation they reminded me of something that mark twain said when they asked him about that he said well i didn't miss the first 3.5 billion years before i was born so i probably won't miss the ones <laughs> after after i'm gone i thought that's pretty good you know because we tend to think oh my god if i die it's going to be black forever and it's like no it's going to be nothing it's just gone i i heard a philosopher say like a philosophy teacher ahead that we can fathom forever you know what i mean like from this point forever on not that we can but it's easier for us to kind of understand that versus that forever has always been going on right it's similar to what mark twain's kind of saying that yeah yeah, yeah. you know i'm going to go to the pearly gates and i'm going to play the harp for the next three i remember i was reading a book i was reading a book in like grade 10 or 11 and it was talking about the earth and the sun and how the sun's going to swallow us up. And I had the worst anxiety attack ever. I was like, because <gasps> I realized if I die and go to heaven, that's a long fucking time to be up there. Just I, like, yeah, I've gone, to, I've gone to New Orleans and, and Vegas for a week. And let me tell you, that's way too long to be in that kind of environment. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. No. Right. Although uh, probably that wouldn't be on offer in heaven. I, I imagine that would be uh, <laughs> In my <laughs> heaven, it would be. It would be more the devil's department, I think. <laughs> oh, we know he has the best tunes. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, just to kind of capsulate here, but I love this bit about awareness and consciousness. And, and, and the Buddhism bit here is that Buddhism kind of brings us back to here and now, which to me is awareness. Mm -hmm. And consciousness is the thinking mind. And I has a did the consciousness create our idea of past and future like without um, without consciousness would we just kind of just like I think, think about an at, animal yeah exactly if yeah. you look at animals i think you'll you'll know if you've had a pet that you know that they they seem to be they have mem they clearly have memories <laughs> they remember that stuff that happens and they clearly can see what's about to happen you know that you're going to go out or you're going to take them for a walk or whatever so they clearly have a sense of the past and the future whether they're conscious of it or not might be a different question but they certainly are aware of it i think but without any means of discussing it then there's no way that they can convey that to anybody else it's like you know could you take me for a walk this afternoon <laughs> it's like there's no there's no way of playing with that flow of time but yes. once you have language you you have a means of slicing it up so you can then talk about time and that means you can think about time i'll see you at 315. yeah exactly but then why 315. why is the 60 minutes in an hour why are the 60 seconds in a minute why the close the minutes? box close the box i know i know exactly but these are all cultural decisions that are made i mean what's extraordinary about that is that those, those date back five thousand years for christ's sake you know yeah the idea of slicing things up into 60s goes back to the sumerians it's, it's mad it's really mad that's right but do you I know why know. what <sighs> you, you, it's the finger no, I thing don't, i don't it's like you, you you take a hand. Let's just put it in front of the camera, right? So, yeah. so yeah, can I can I do this? No. Um, so one, you have three joints on each finger. So you count them with your thumb. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve joints. But well, I'm I'm not in the camera. You've got twelve joints on on your hand. Like one, yeah. two, three, four, five, six, 
7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 joints. So you can count them using your thumb. So you could say that's six, right? Because it's, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So with one hand you count up to 12 and the other hand you've got five. So five times 12 is 60. That's how you get to 60. So it's a way of, instead of going, oh, you can only count up to 10 because you've only got 10 fingers. No, no, no. You can use your joints and then you go up to 60. So that's how they got to 60. And that was one of their primal divisions. And we're still using it, even though different societies along the way have decided to slice the day up into tens. Like the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians had 10 hours in a day. I mean, 10 is a much more obvious system because we have 10 fingers, but yeah. Yeah. we don't use that system. It's weird. That tells you something about the inherent conservativeness of culture, if you like. This is it's 5,000 years old. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's older than the wheel. It's just crazy. It, it, and you're also talking about the days of the week and how yeah. those had the names. Like Moon Day. I was yeah. like, oh, my God, obviously. I know. And but Sunday. Know, yeah. But then the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday are named after the ancient gods of the Scandinavians, you know, the Tiu, Woden, Thor, and Freya. Those are the four gods. So that's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday is Saturn. Saturn. Yeah. But I, I, I knew Thursday was Thor's day, but I honestly, like, it's kind of like they say, the answer is right in front of your face. Like, like Sunday, I, mm. I kind of knew that was the day of the sun, but no idea that Monday was moon day. But it, but in a way, it's it's really primitive. It's like, why are we using the names of long dead gods? Why don't we do what you know they do in in Hebrew, which is they say day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven. That's it. You know, that makes a lot more sense. Why what are we messing around with gods that we don't even know what they are? And it's like, you know, who was Freya for God's sake? You know, for example, you know, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it's that old adage. Um... We're, we're immersed in the language of yeah. the cultures that we despise or something. And the one guy says, thank God I'm an atheist. <laughs> that's a Jerry Fialka line, by the way. Oh, right. That's a good one. That's yeah. a good one. Thank God I'm an atheist. Yeah. Well, what, so, do atheists say, what do atheists say when they come? That's a, that's a Bill Hicks line. <laughs> oh, chemical chance. <laughs> oh, oh, dopamine. Chemical chance. Oh, chemical chance. Yeah. Oh, dopamine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So you, you finished this book. Uh, yeah. What's what's next for you, Simon? I mean, you're you're Jesus working on the United Nations. Here we come. I love it. You uh, let me know what you need from me. Uh, well, get this get this out there. Get people. I, I don't know. I'm just sort of trying to. I'm I'm learning about marketing. I've never had to do any marketing in my life, so I I didn't realize that writing the book was the easiest bit. The the difficult bit is is trying to get people to to read it. But I just got a really great endorsement from uh, Stephen Pinker. You know Stephen Pinker? Oh, hell oh, yeah. yeah. I know who Stephen Pinker Ooh. is. Yeah. No, uh, I, I, you see, he was, um, he took part in a panel discussion with Noam Chomsky. <laughs> so do you know this guy, Dr. Brian Green? He's like, uh, in America, yeah. he's yeah. he's a sort of like a scientist. Astrophysicist. Yeah. But he Big kind of deal. does like, you know, ballpark science programs about all kinds of things. So it was part of some online science festival. And so they were doing a piece on language. So they had Noam Chomsky, uh, Steve Pinker, a guy called Daniel Dorr, who's an Israeli linguist, and uh, this woman who was a, I think she was a brain scientist of some kind, I forget. Don't remember her name. Anyway, I thought, well, I'll watch this, see what they got to say. And so Brian Green, because he's not a linguist, he was like going at it with that. Okay, so, um, so tell me how we have language, you know, and they're going, <laughs> we don't know that. And he's going, what do you mean you don't know that? It's like, well, we don't know. No, it's a big mystery. I don't know. You know, it's like, so essentially Chomsky came on first and did his thing. And, and then they asked, the finally got to Daniel Dorr, the, the, you know, the proper professional linguist as in sort of new generation kind of guy. And, uh, so tell me in simple, you know, just, just simple that someone doesn't really know, just explain your best guess of how language happened. And the guy's just going, oh, well, you know, we had this thing that happened to us and 
you know, cognitive revolution, and then you know, a bit of grammar stuff went on. It was all so it was so vague, and you could just see Brian Green's face. He's going, "This is all you've got. This yeah. this is what you got. This is it." So I uh, and Steve Pinker, they had him on last, and he more or less they said, "So, so you guys don't know, right?" Basically, and he said, "Yeah, no, we don't. We don't." So I thought. I'm going to just check. So I, I tracked him down. I sent him an email. I said, um, so what about this idea then? And uh, he was going, oh, yeah, no, no, we know about that. And I said, well, OK, where exactly have you ever said that language, the starting point was that switched from analog noises to digital sounds? And he goes, oh, yeah, no, I wrote about that in my book. And I and I said, and I went, no, I, he, I looked at the book again just to check because I knew he hadn't said that. And I went back to him and I said, excuse me, you didn't say that. You said, you you, you talk about sort of combin combinatory structures and things, but you don't actually say that it's a digital switch. And then I just discovered, this is one of these things the universe works for you sometimes. I discovered that he was giving a talk in London the next week. It's like, what? What was the chances of that, right? Because he's, he's in Harvard or wherever. He's Canadian, I think, originally. So... Um, I said, right, I'll see you at your talk. So I went down to the talk and uh, <laughs> shamelessly at the end of the talk, I just went up to him and I said, look, here's, you sign your book and I'll give you mine, right? So we swapped book. <laughs> and he emailed me back later and he said, yeah, I think you're right. So I have the, I have the, I have the big thumbs up from uh, Steve Pinker, which is, uh, I'm wearing yeah, that as a bag of pride at the moment. <laughs> That's that's a badge of honor, man. He's he's a big fish. He is a big fish. Not not that you aren't or that you know. No, 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 no. Come on, he is. He's out there. I mean, he's written all these fat books and you know. Enlightenment now, I think he's is one oh, of wow, the yes. ones. Yeah. I have it right here. Yeah. There, there you go. Yeah, so well, um anyway, I I'm so I'm trying to figure out how I can bring my book more to people's attention because I think that there is something in it that's uh, worth knowing about. And I'm just taking it from how do we have language? How do we have it in the first place? And I think I've got an idea that works. And then what does it do to you? you know, what happens when a species gets language? Because it's just like a tool. It's like, you know, suddenly we've got a car or something or, you know, machine guns or something it's like we've suddenly got this amazingly powerful thing and what does it do to you well it creates cultures because suddenly we can talk about stuff and then the next thing you know it's like well whoa why, why are we here oh my god there must be a god or gods or you know religion's the next thing you go down the next thing you know you've got an identity and then my god you're trapped in this thing and it's like how do i get out wait six sex drugs and rock and roll yes out the other side and then what do i do when i'm free I try and figure out why the earth isn't flat. And then I figure out that and then, oh my God, I've invented printing shit. And now it's the internet. That's pretty much it. You know, that's the story of the book. Just like that. I love it. Then we're left with the end problem. That's, you know. That's where you're pushing us. Hey, I, I got it at the library. Like I bought my copy, but then oh, I, well said, Thank I you. said, hey, I, I requested it. And they're like, yeah, because it was, we, I mean, we could talk about why there was some problems around it, but they were like, yep, we got it in for you. It's ready for you. I'm like, great. So I, I took it out and then I returned it because I'd already read it. But anyways, it's available in my library. You can get it. Cool. There. I'm very impressed. You Thank you. So everybody else do that, please. <laughs> that's the goal, man. Let's, let's get yeah. the word out there. This is get the, the Gutenberg galaxy. This is yes. <laughs> well, Simon, thank you very much. Um, great talking I, I, to you. Always. I appreciate your time. I we got to do this again because there's so many other endeavors that you're doing that I would love to discuss. But okay, well, we've run out of time. It's my bedtime. Oh my god, it's yes, whatever it was. <laughs> we gone way past the time. There you go. Well, thank the, time, you, Sam. the time went like that. You see the fun you can have with language. Just 44 little noises that we strung together in just about every combination we could think of to make <laughs> this happen. And like I said, we've been around the world and back. It's wonderful. And open the box many a times. <laughs> Thank you very much, Simon. Okay. See you.